but it was some of the, it was just glorious. It was some of the best fun I had. I just, those periods where I get the new game, I just know that that's going to be two months of just rocking. So a lot of fans have actually been very inspired by your work, uh, mainly through the interviews you did through the PlayStation Underground, where you did something I don't think anybody's ever done uh, often, which is that you actually showed the process from beginning to end of how you made the music. And it really inspired a lot of people to actually make music, kind of like following that as a tutorial, as a guideline. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something which is a, a, a trade secret here, but I have input quantized, which means that I can play it very badly, and it comes back played very nicely. So a lot of people have... I think I know to... why. Oh, go ahead. I think the reason is because it's a very simple process. <laughs> and um, you could do it pretty much on, um, you know, what's that, um, like uh, garage band. Uh -huh. uh, the, the elements of spiral music were very, very simple. Um, pretty much guitar, bass, and drums. Mm -hmm. And then like one or two effects. Well, it's amazing that you've managed to make uh, such phenomenal music for such simple sounds. I think you said it best um, during the panel for the Reignited Trilogy. Simplest, simplest Maybe. stuff. But once again, when art is distilled, it has more power. Working with a skinnier palette actually somehow made the creative juices flow more richly. When you're so limited, you get more creative out of that limited uh, capacity, if that makes sense. It does. It, uh, I know exactly what you mean, or rather what you think I meant. I know what I meant. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it, like it, if you only have three a, instruments, is, you get more creative with those three instruments. Absolutely. And the, the other revelation from working on Spyro is that if you're under the gun, and, you know, volume does not mean any diminishment of quality. In mm -hmm. fact, I, to this day, am reaching back into the Spyro catalog for a theme for my symphony, in fact, I have mm -hmm. turned a couple of, uh, I, I have made a couple of symphonic pieces out of Spyro. Yeah, you, you did mention previously that you've actually like uh, gone back to Spyro for inspiration when writing the orchestra and things like that. Yeah, well, I think the reason is, this is my theory, mm -hmm. and actually, by the way, I, I did talk to um, cognitive uh, scientists um, in Harvard, uh, Stanford, and Princeton, because I was doing a documentary about music for the BBC. You know, why is it? What, what is it about music? What's mm -hmm. going on in our brains with music? Um, and um, the, when you are in, under the gun and you're just turning and burning, you get rid of all your, your, your judgment and you just come up with stuff without thought. And it goes deeper and deeper into your native instinct, which is mm -hmm. where all the emotion is. Gotcha. All right, well, uh, again, a lot of people have actually gotten access to those original sound fonts and have begun making new tracks uh, inspired by your work. So I guess my first question to you would be, have you actually listened to any of this Spyro fan music before today, or have you not been exposed to it? Yeah, I have. There's a guy in Australia who lovingly tracked down every single gadget that I had, including the sound effects libraries that I had on uh, CD-ROMs, uh, or the DVD ROM. God knows. I mean, the technology is uh -huh. so dead. It was like 20 minutes ago. Who can remember? You know, <laughs> um, and others who have really and 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 the uh, the mo um, the modes are pretty limited in variety. Um, by the way, this may sound like I'm disparaging my own music. Not at all. <laughs> I say with great pride that it is very simple. Um, mm -hmm. But it is. I have heard. Uh, also, or other orchestral, other instrumental arrangements of the, uh, the tunes, uh, which I enjoy immensely. Awesome, awesome. All right, so I guess uh, you, I mean, you kind of answered it there, but I'm kind of interested on your perspective on how you actually feel about people that have gotten access to this uh, sound font in the libraries and are making new music inspired by your work, but specifically are Spyro fan music. How do you feel about that? Humbled and honored. Awesome. I think a lot of people would be really glad to hear that. Uh, I was actually speaking with one of the composers, and they all had this same concern, where it's kind of like, does he approve? Does he approve? We don't know. There are artists who take a different view, um, who regard any encroachment on their creation 
as a crime against art. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even begin to understand. I've had these debates, and I just don't comprehend any aspect of it. Um, you know, for my buddy Sting, for instance, he loves it when people, met, you know, screw around with his songs, do something new with them, take his original idea and take mm -hmm. it somewhere else. It makes him feel like Rodgers and Hammerstein, makes him feel, you know, like he's contributed to the zeitgeist. <laughs> and I, too, feel that same honor. Awesome. Well, actually, um, kind of off track, but kind of on the same topic. Um, is it that kind of what inspired the, uh, I believe you're doing the police deranged orchestra. Is that right? Something similar like that, yes. where you're sort of taking those original tunes and just really messing with them and making some new stuff out of it? Yeah, um, and so far, Sting's all over. He loves it. <laughs> awesome. All right, so um, since a lot of the composers have actually have to sit down and listen to your work and sort of break down the songs in order to make, uh, again, songs inspired by that, a lot of them have been analyzing your approach. And I'm kind of curious how your approach changed throughout the original three games, because they're very distinctively different. So I'm just curious how you went about it every time you went in to compose for a new game. Um, over the three or four year period, every year, new discs would come out with different sound palettes on mm -hmm. them. Um, and while the guitar, bass, and drums stayed with the same samples, um, the top lines were very different, and I had new vocabulary of things to, you know, m more or less sound effects that I could try and figure out how to make music with sound effects, mm -hmm. dogs barking, you know, s s scratch, you know, just weird noises and so on, you know, uh -huh. yowls and howls. Uh, and it may be that deeper analysis would reveal that the riffs are very similar, but only the sound effects are different. Gotcha. So you've got you know, a new place to play with. Different, <laughs> yeah, different palette of of, of uh, there's no song, there's no top line, therefore, and so the top line is whatever kind of effects I can come up with. All right. So I'm not sure if you are aware, um, this sort of all happened very quickly and very coincidentally, but tomorrow is actually Spyro's birthday. I believe it's the 22nd anniversary. So... Really? He can drink. <laughs> well, he's been able to drink since last year, I think. Uh, everybody kind of missed it. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's, that's interesting. He's yeah, he's one year older than my daughter. Oh, for real? <laughs> it's quite exciting. Uh, so, yeah, what would you actually be doing to celebrate, if, you, if anything at all? I mean, you did, probably didn't know until today, so would you be doing anything to celebrate? I didn't know until today, but I will certainly uh, raise a glass in Spyro's honor. <laughs> just, just a nice you know, shot. The whole Spyro experience is absolutely one of the highlights of my composing career. And what gives it an extra zing um, in my heart is that it's so undignified, it's so unelevated, it's so uh, music for money, it's so hired gun, it's mm -hmm. so commercial. But that doesn't affect the quality of the inspiration. Whether you're paying me or not, it's the same inspiration. And mm -hmm. in Spyro, they hired me to write back, it's like writing a quadruple album every summer <laughs> of backing tracks. Uh -huh. But it was some of the. It was just glorious. It was some of the best fun I had. I just those periods where I get the new game. I just know that that's going to be two months of just rocking, and uh, and I really enjoy hearing the music as well as I'm making it. So, you know, working on a Francis Ford Coppola movie, uh, his hierarchy, writing a concerto for orchestra, is kind of more elevated artistic enterprise. But man, there are no better or worse in the quality of artistic experience the actual creative i'm sitting here with my gear having fun making music spyro was right up there as one of the high points of fun gigs awesome so on on that note uh, i am curious because usually with artists it's very difficult for them to uh pick favorites with music but i'm curious if you have a favorite um anything that is with spyro whether that's a favorite spiral level that you played through or a favorite track that you made for all those tracks are not the same as the level where they appeared. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I make a confession that I made the music looking at a specific level, and when the game count came out, I found that they had actually shuffled them around. Oh. Um, so my idea of which track goes with which level actually is inaccurate. But I remember that Potato was one of my favorites. Um, avocado, Loved Avocado was great. Um... Cherry, Cherry was a, one of my favorite riffs. It involved kind of a 
period Farfisa organ sound. Mm -hmm. There was one that was a level for season three, perhaps. And my children would sing, go put your shoes on now. Put your shoes on. It was like a home level. Oh, I'm not sure what that is. You're three, you said, or you're two? I think it was three. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, We're probably going to have to go figure that out later. (laughs) All righty. I think three was the best one. Four, I confess, I started to get a little, um, you know, a little fatigue on year four. Mm -hmm. Um, So, but but the year three, I think, was the, the high point for me. Uh, well, I w- on that note, actually, I do want to ask, because I was going to ask this later, but it seems appropriate now. Um, I was looking through your catalog of things and projects you've worked on, and I noticed that other than Spyro and one other game, you haven't really uh, composed for video games since, and I'm just curious why that is. Uh, didn't get hired. Really? No, nobody yeah. approached you for that? Nope. Uh, well, it, it was only two, three years later that I got out of the um, commercial composing business. Mm-hmm. You know, that's when I, you know, I, I don't do film scores anymore or games. Um, and that began at around 2009. Gotcha. Which I, yeah, I was although gonna... I did go back and write a new uh, main title for, you know. Yeah, that was uh, fun. <laughs> yeah. It's an interesting story about the Reignited watch was that for some reason they didn't call and i did get a mysterious call can you send um any audio that you have which i happen to have because i keep good mm-hmm. you know my, my record i keep my vault is pretty secure um <laughs> the and so i did so i sent them all the music and forgot all about it oh mm-hmm. by the way now let me tell you the most fun story of all okay so i'm a dad at a west side private school and they have these gala events where everybody can, you know, they, they, you know, you, you can bid for somebody's holiday home in the Bahamas for two weeks or something like mm-hmm. that. And every, it's raising money for the school. And, and um, every, I put in a drum, drum lesson. And every year some dad comes over with his kid and the kid could care less, but the dad's like uh-huh. a police fan, you know. And so I tell the dad war stories and show the kid how to hold the sticks and, you know, <laughs> pretty harmless stuff. One, one year, uh, dad comes over and no kid just the dad and uh he wants a drum lesson so okay i give it to him and then i'm checking him out and trying to figure out who he is and kind of guess you know he's sort of in his 40s i guess uh um and he's you know it's an expensive school so he obviously is good at something uh mm-hmm. drums he you know he, he's a band not in a band but he probably writes songs kind of maybe he's a composer and there's some dads at the school who write broadway hits and they don't look like rock stars, but they make a lot of money out of writing Broadway hits, you know. <laughs> and um, and I think, ah, yeah, that must be it. And as he's walking out, he looks up and he sees I've got one of the few ornaments of, uh, one of the few uh, trophies that I've got uh, was a Spyro one, because I'm particularly proud of Spyro, the, mm-hmm. the quadruple platinum whatever. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, do you enjoy that Spyro uh, experience? And so I went into a soliloquy about how much fun it was and, uh, my plan is that, you know, I've been doing film scores with orchestra, and I wanna, I'd really love to do Spyro with orchestra. All i got to do is find out who owns the uh, the copyright, who owns the IP, because mm-hmm. the people who hired me were sold on, and, you know, God knows who owns it. No, I said, I can help you with that. I own it. What? I am the, I am the CEO of, my brain's gone blank, the, the giant, giant corporation that owns everything to do with caves, uh, Activision. Mm-hmm. Is Activision? Yeah. yeah. I am the CEO of Activision. And you know what? I think it'd be a good idea to reissue that game. What okay. The world. <laughs> so a couple of years go by, but they, it turns out they did, you know, I did get this call about, could you send the music? So I sent it. And that was the last I heard. Meanwhile, they hired somebody to earball all of it. Jesus Christ, all of it. And not just figure out what the baseline is, but find that base sample. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, he did an astounding job. He really, not only did he find all the right samples, but he uh, got the rhythmic emphasis, you know, because there is 
dynamic range, even mm-hmm. on a synthesizer. You know, that bass line's not da 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 you know. And he got all those nuances really accurately, um, but with uh higher resolution sounds, you know, I was working on sixteen bit, now he's on God knows what, you know. And uh and in the same way that visually the game was so much more tweaked where the spiral used to run across a green field. Now it's a green grass field, and you can see every blade of grass mm-hmm. and several different varieties of grass, you know. Um, so that same effect kind of went into the music where it was much richer richer samples that he used that st- still had the same effect. So I was a big fan. And I met up with a guy at that event and, you know, congratulated him heartily for his work and um, told him that, dude, you could have called, I could have, not only just given you all the discs which I still own, I haven't got the readers for them anymore. Uh, I haven't got the the you know the, the boxes, the Kurzweil unit that, that that I got a lot of that stuff from. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the other one? There's another really cheap one that just had the best sounds. Uh, can't remember what it's called. Anyhow, I could have shown you, and I still got the MIDI MIDI profiles. I could have just sent you all those MIDI files. You wouldn't have to listen to a damn thing. <laughs> you know, plug in these samples to those MIDI files, and you're done. Um, and I guess they perhaps thought that I would come at them with some kind of claim of ownership of the copyright. Mm-hmm. Um, I did check the contract. Uh, I'll confess. Uh, and it is absolutely clear. They own every scintilla of that music mm. yeah I, and they can do what the hell they want with it yeah i, I saw and, a comment uh, so, people were wanted you to like release all the music on itunes and i'm like does he even have the rights to that music so i guess that answers that question uh i do not um but i'm sure that if i were and i intend to by the way i do intend to and i absolutely would have the cooperation of activision mm-hmm. um whatever the subdivision it is uh, I got along really well with those folks, and I'm sure it wouldn't be a problem. I just, I, I got to get that together. Um, I'm on five other, I'm, I'm writing two other operas and a police tend to get that together. <laughs> Wait, so uh, you just finished writing one opera recently, right? That was the one for ooh, uh, Nikola Tesla, right? Yes. And, um, hmm. The premiere was moved to next summer, and right now I'm writing another opera for Italy. Um, uh, it hasn't been announced yet, so I can't okay, yeah, divulge. Hush, hush. I will have two <laughs> opera world premieres within a month of each other next summer. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to see that you're still getting some interesting projects in the works, even if everybody's stuck inside. Actually, you probably get more work now that you're stuck it's inside. The perfect, <laughs> it's the perfect thing for being stuck inside. I don't want to go out. <laughs> perfect. You know, I, I remind myself of, you know, the the apocalypse that is out there, and I feel and empathize with all those who aren't able to sit in their studio and comfort and do what they do. Mm-hmm. You know, delivery people. I look at delivery people and I think these are the heroes of our times and I thank them for their service. A hundred percent. Well, and I, I mean, not just delivery people, but all the people who couldn't stay home and do have to go out and exactly. work. Exactly. I, I am, I am with them in spirit. The people that are still keeping the world going in circles, basically. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, on that note, um, as far as with uh, you know technology and being stuck inside, I'm kind of curious because you were someone who was there before technology was as powerful or was even as relevant in music, and now you're witnessing all this fresh blood that can, uh, as you mentioned previously, can make music on their laptop. I'm kind of curious on your perspective on the direction that technology is giving to people. Um, what it does is lower the bar, and mm-hmm. that's a good thing. And because when you lower the bar with art, um, it's the natural course of music. Anyway, music where every human being on the planet is, is a musician. We're not all Eric Clapton, but we are, and we have in this. I, like I say, I've been talking to these uh, cognitive neurologists and so on. Mm-hmm. We are, all of us can, can sing a melody, a dog pant, a, a whale has its own melodic thing, I guess. But... Um, we are all extremely good at music. We can, we can move our bodies in synchronization with mu- music. In fact, we involuntarily do move our bodies with music. Music can literally usurp motor control of our bodies and induce us to jerk in time with it. 
and not just any jerking, but sexually explicit pelvic thrusting. Okay, a fam- um, family-friendly show, Stuart. Family fr- <laughs> yes, but, um, you know, Shakespeare doesn't have that effect on your, your body. Uh-huh. Um, music, music goes, well, my point is that music goes very, very deep into your nervous system. Mm-hmm. And um, I forget, started us on this journey into your, deep into your nervous system. Um, Where were we going with this? Anyway? I don't know. I think I think you got really into the the pelvic and all that, and then we just got very confused. No, no, we just we just diverted. As soon as we got into the pelvic, whatever the hell we were talking about went out the window. <laughs> yeah, basically your perspective on uh, how technology is basically lowering oh, the bar. Oh, okay. So, so, so lowering the bar, lowering the bar. We are all musicians, and if you lower the bar, you increase the talent pool. Somebody like Moby, mm-hmm. who can't play. I don't know. I don't know if you can or can't, but I assume. That he's not a guitarist nor a keyboard player, but he is, as a human being, a musician. So mm-hmm. he was able to take musical elements that he did not create with his own fingers, but that he heard, and his musical mind, his innate human musicality, enabled him to assemble give music. Mm-hmm. And um, DJs also take music that they didn't make with their own fingers and really seriously affect pelvic motion. Um, <laughs> and so it's a it's a basic human trait that we're all good at and the technology brings it within the grasp of everyone and that's a good thing because music began as a non-specialized thing um uh, music mm-hmm. has been in human you know uh, homo sapiens longer than agriculture about thirty thousand years before we figured out how to plant stuff and how to keep these cows kind of over here together so we don't have to chase them through the jungle. You know, agriculture Mm -hmm. was about 10,000 years ago. Um, Music was about 40,000 years ago, between 45 and 35,000 years ago. The first musical instruments have been found, uh, not drums, because those are perishable materials, but um, flutes made out of vulture bone. Um, And these, that shows how deep music is. And it, it was a bonding um, uh, edge for Homo sapiens versus, say, Neanderthal, which did not have music, as far as we know. And uh, Australopithecine also did not have music. Florensis, all these other hominids, cousins of ours, didn't have music. Music was Homo sapiens' secret sauce. And here's why. Because music could make 40 Homo sapiens bond as a group singing songs together who could go kick those five Neanderthals out of the fruit, fruit tree, <laughs> and that bonding of many humans together made Homo sapiens the winner in the hominid um, competition for planet Earth. Well, all right then. Uh, so on that note, let's actually jump into the game. <laughs> We're going to have you listen to some music. You say whether you wrote it or, or you sorry composed it or whether you didn't compose it. Keep in mind they might have some tunes in there from the original Spiral Sound font. So. Just because you hear that little da 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 doesn't mean you wrote it. <laughs> you didn't write it, but you didn't compose the whole thing. I wrote that part. Yeah, you wrote that part. So I'm just going to play you a few. That's, a, that's not a well-looped sample. I, I spot it as, as, a, um, as, a, um, as a relative, but not uh, mm-hmm. first, not... not uh, not mine. And not yours. You are correct. That was Storm Speedway by Dr. Tape Worm, The Horrible Thing. Um, okay, well, actually, no, the giveaway, um, <clears throat> if you played the rest of the music, I'm sure it's a pretty nice piece of music. Um, but the giveaway, uh, the tell, was that the loop, the rhythm loop, seemed to have a glitch in it. Mm-hmm. And um, he is probably not as um as um what's the word i'm looking for uh, autistic as i am uh, <laughs> i would uh, i would have figured the bpm whatever it took to break that loop uh-huh. yeah i think a lot of these are going to be you're going to realize this right away just because it's something you've never done uh because obviously they're doing their own thing while still following your uh ideas basically yeah yeah i mean i, I recognize the vibe <laughs> all right here comes the next one God, that's so 
so so broken up I can't even hear what the riff is. <laughs> There's a house on my street, and it looks real neat. I'll go for a drive in it. That sounds exactly like a song that I wrote for the police. Um, I don't. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go with not mine. Oh, that actually is yours. That's, Even uh, though Twilight I Harbor. recognize that bass line. Huh? Beg your pardon. Oh, yeah, that actually is yours. It's uh, Twilight Harbor. Well, what do you know? But again, it, it's that? probably just because the audio is so choppy. <laughs> so I'll give you a pass on that one. All right. Here comes the next one. Uh, well, now you're making me feel like Salvador Dali. <laughs> he was older and in mental decline. He would see his painting in a gallery or a, or a museum and say, that's not <laughs> my work, thereby depriving gazillions of dollars from the value of these items hanging on the wall somewhere. <laughs> uh, well, again, we'll, you know, we'll you give keep, it a pass. Keep, keep Salvador out of the gallery. <laughs> Did you compose that? I really can't hear it at all. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, <laughs> yeah, uh, I apologize. This would have been. I, I'm, I'm going to once again say not mine. I'm kind of on a, on a roll there with that. But I, 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 I'm really having a hard time discerning. Yeah. Uh, in, in the future, I will definitely. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. I couldn't fix this because it's all through phones. And of course, the. Uh, phone companies uh, thought it'd be great if all the quality was extremely compressed to save money. So, mm. yeah, not much I can do there. But uh, that is actually uh, by uh, Copeland, not Copeland. It's two separate words. Uh, that is in Raptured Acres. That is an entire Very nice. YouTube channel dedicated to you. <laughs> all right, what do you know? One. Very nice. Hopefully this one you can actually hear properly. Let's see. Not seconds. mine. You're correct. Not mine. That is a Stormy Towers by Nanashima. Very nice. Nice groove. Well, I can't hear the bass line. I know there's a bass line there, but I can't hear what it is. The, gu the guitar swing sounds like mine, but that's just mm -hmm. a sample. Um, can't hear the bass line. Yeah, I think the the audio actually like cuts that bass line completely. Kind of unfortunate. Can you sing it to me? Uh, it goes a little. <laughs> uh, I don't think I can hear it either because I unplugged on. it to hear it. If you actually, you know what? If I actually unplug this and play it through my mic, you'd probably hear it better. Would you? Does that sound better? How did that sound? That's mine. Yep, that's yours. <laughs> that is a dark passage. Yeah, and that does sound better. It's okay, quieter, so... but actually it's not so broken up. That's fine. Then in fact, let me just blow up the audio here, because I think putting it through the XLR is probably what's screwing it up. Not mine. Correct. That is uh, Volcanic Vial by Mr. Spyro98 the Dragon. I remember that level. <laughs> you know, um, I was actually pretty crap at playing the game, but I got cheats from the company. I have and also that. in the, um, the, uh, the versions I got were sometimes incomplete. Mm -hmm. And there was one, one version I got where Spyro could fly out of, you know, like fly through, there was no ceiling, so he could uh -huh. fly out into space, turn around and look back at the entire world from a thousand miles away, Wow! you know, or a hundred miles away, and then and go back in there and reach, and then fly back into it. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the the designers said, well, it just goes into infinity mode, and it has a, a perspective, and some of the... Um, what do they call them, the motion engine, the physics engine. Mm -hmm. Some of the physics engines, even if there's one anomaly, 
the other rules of physics will still apply. So even though I had escaped the bounds of the parameters of the level, um, mm -hmm. the physics engine with regard to all of it still worked. So I could fly out of the world and look back at it. Wow, that actually like sounds kind of fun. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was always curious what kind of sheets they gave you, like if they just give you like infinite lives or infinite sparks and you could just ramp through the level. Well, the, the infinite lives is no fun because, you know, nothing's a jeopardy. The, mm -hmm. the one I did enjoy the most was infinite fireballs. Oh, <laughs> was it the second game, I think, or the third one? Yeah, I think so. All right, well, let's go ahead and quickly run through these. Did you compose this song? Very close to my style, but not mine. That is correct. That is Gleaming Coast by Mr. Modus Pineapple. Uh, yeah, I heard that when I immediately thought, is this an actual track? <laughs> not mine. That actually is yours. That is Spiral 2, Riptus possibly be. <laughs> it could possibly be some of the scoring for the uh, action scenes that they shot. You know, we win a level and the boss does a little routine and they talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Or there's some, you know, I forget what those are called. Uh, um, this one's during the hockey game, so it might be a cutscene. Yeah, yeah. And the reason for that that ascending uh, tune there, which is sporty but not of my thing, that's more of a baseball game kind of uh, mode. Gotcha, um, gotcha. I wasn't aware of that. All right. Well, some of those had had other elements, that, and, and and I only heard them for the ten minutes it took to compose them, and I never heard them again. Uh, Whereas okay. the riffs, I played and played and played and played in the game, mm -hmm. and listened to uh, a lot. But some of those um, incidental music for the cut action sequences, um, mm -hmm. I only saw them for the ten minutes I worked on them. Gotcha. And and uh, as you can hear from that one there, maybe seven minutes. <laughs> And by any chance, because when you were talking about make like, the original game, we saw you were like just using like the meta keyboard, and you specifically said that you never actually used an actual note. Oh, no, sorry, not an actual instrument. <laughs> like you didn't. Oh no, no, uh, no! Key... I never used an actual instrument ever. Gotcha. Because in a way, the sound of the game was was that 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 those you know that Hammond organ sound. I, I, mm -hmm. That's the <clears throat> the holy grail of samples. I love that sound. <laughs> What was the technical way that you actually made this music? It's entirely electronic. Wow. Uh, there is not a single live, not even the drums. I didn't, I didn't hit or strum or blow a single note. It was all on a Fairlight. Uh, it was driven by Fairlight at first, which was an 8-bit, eight 8-track eight machine. Yeah, I think that's also very inspiring for people because it's like, oh, look what I did without playing a single instrument. You're, you can do it in your laptop, too. So a lot of people are really Absolutely. inspired, too. And I also think yeah. that also goes back to uh, when you were talking about, I saw, I saw an interview from a long, long time ago when you were talking about the beginnings of the punk era and how you said uh, anybody can just play three chords and you've got a whole song going. Again, about lowering that bar, I think is very important. Yeah, absolutely. A larger talent pool. Of course, it's terrible for the people who are in there. You know, it's more competitors. Mm -hmm. um, but for the, for the folks out there listening, for the consumers of music, it's, it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Not mine. All right, that is correct. That is um, Nork Hub by Super Sora Dude. Cool riff. All right, let me do another one where I'll jump in halfway through. Not really hearing that sound. I'm going to give it uh, a thumbs up for the moment, but I can't really hear it. Oh, sorry. Let me get a what I can hear sounds like mine. Yeah, let me play a little closer. Hmm. I don't. I don't remember it at all. But it, I, I spot my tells in there. I don't remember it. I didn't. You know, I, don't, I have no recollection of it. But I. I. I claim it. <laughs> All right, well, that actually wasn't by you. That was by Genonen. It's called Submerged Bass. Um, 
So again, they're all taking Well, I this. claim it. <laughs> well, it's yours now, I guess. I'm sure they'd be happy to just sell it to you. <laughs> I, I adopt him as one of my children. <laughs> all right. So far, my batting average is not that high. You're actually doing pretty well. Uh, there's only a few that are kind of confusing. And again, I'm just going to blame them to my crappy audio issues. I'm not really going to blame, blame that on you. <laughs> well, that's my excuse. Yeah, I'm blaming your gear. Yeah, ultimately, just throw it all on me and you're good. Like... <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Happy to. God, I just can't hear enough of it. I just can't hear it. Yeah, I don't know if you want me to put it like right up to the mic. I'm kind of like, I don't want to like blow up your ears by accident. <laughs> no, no, um, put it right because when you first uh, started on this version, it uh, was working pretty well. That last one, I couldn't hear it. Just okay, no problem. Yeah. Wasn't enough of it. Yeah, that's mine. Yep, uh, that right, is uh, Metro Speedway. All right, we've only got five more left. Let's quickly run through these. I think that's one that I—that's a riff that I used in my orchestral piece. Well, you did say you've gone back a number of times, so very much likely. I'm thinking no. That is not yours. That is Jungle Speedway by, oh, I'm going to butcher this name, Mechanizer 8. Oh, very good. These are, by the way, the ones that are not mine, I think um, next time I do a game, next time they, you know, they do a new spiral, send them along and I'll, and I'll rip them off. <laughs> well, actually, on YouTube, people have actually made these, uh, what are they called? Uh playlist on youtube where you can just look up spiral fan music and they'll show up like 198 songs just click on those yeah. that's actually how i discovered all these songs and became a fan of the community mine <laughs> like you immediately recognize that <laughs> well i mean uh, that's that's a riff i would go i could make a symphony out of that <laughs> awesome da, 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 da. Very close, very close, but not mine. That is correct. That is Witch's Way by Toasty. Uh, a lot of people have said he's probably gotten... the One of the people have gotten the closest to the the Copeland style, I guess is what we're calling it now. <laughs> well, that that is. And um, it's Oops. probably quantifiable in some, some way. Um, just that looking at that purple dragon and puts you into an emotional place. Mm -hmm. which has a certain language. And I think this guy here, Toasty, has figured out that language because that is exactly something that I would have written, but I don't think I wrote that one. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, two more left. Let's see if you can figure these out. Nope. That is correct. That is Cyanide Swamp by Creatology Studios. All right, final song. Now let me uh, jump it in the middle here. Yeah, very close, very close, but no. <laughs> All right, you're nailing this down. Right, that is Norcob by Copeland Acolyte. All right, awesome. So, um, now that you've actually listened to the fan music, has your perspective changed at all? And how do you feel about the community? I am very warm that there is such a community. Um, I've met a few of them who come to shows. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gratified to be known to a certain uh, group of people as the guy who did Spyro. And, hey, you know, he used to play in a band, too. No. <laughs> you know, I get a nice feeling from that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm very grateful because... Musicians are, I'm speaking for myself, and I'm pretty sure most professional musicians, we make music because it's what we want to do rather than 
figure out actuar- actuarials for an insurance company or something. Mm-hmm. Um, it really is what we want to do. And the fact that there are people who want to listen to what we do, to, to uh, receive what we make, is absolutely gives us purpose in our life. And sometimes if you're a pop star, they're too much love actually is a thing. Um, and it's overwhelming and we're only equipped emotionally to handle a certain amount of attention. And we want attention, but damn, unbelievably I can divulge, there is such a thing as too much attention, um, uh, so surprisingly. Um, but the overall feeling is gratitude. Mm-hmm. I'm grateful that my little scribblings actually uh, affect people the way writing it affects me. And I, I kiss the ground that I walk on and the blessings that I receive that there are people who, who get it, who, awesome. who, you know, who receive it um, with the same feeling that I put into it. All right, well, great. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, again, a lot of people are going to be really happy to hear that. And I think uh, this might actually inspire even more people to pick up the instruments and start uh, strumming their own. <laughs> so um, Absolutely. I did this sort it's of easier than you think. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've said that many times. In fact, I saw an interview from like way, way at the beginning of the police where you said, drumming is so easy. Like, <laughs> In fact, I'm a frustrated guitar player. I wish I could play guitar. In fact, I do play lots of guitar on piano and all these things. But the thing that comes most easily is drums, and it's also very uh, fun to play, I suppose. They, they, drums are really easy to play. I don't know if it's just because I find it that way, but they really are. They're a joke. Anyone can do this. And I think that even actually that. no, it's uh, conceptually easy, but physically, it's, I, I you know one couple summers ago I I played guitar in a band mm-hmm. and sang in the front of the stage. Uh, long story, but the lesson was that man, this is cake. I'm hardly breaking a sweat here. <laughs> I I can rehearse all day into the night. I haven't changed my T-shirt once, and I look back at the the drummer working his ass off. <laughs> work and sweating and and i'm realizing that none of the musicians i've played with in 50 years has ever confessed how much easier their job is than the drummer who physically carries the band every foot down the highway <laughs> uh well i guess you will you be playing a little bit more guitar down the line just because of that uh just because i enjoy doing it i just you know, I enjoy playing guitar doesn't mean i'm any good at it Oh well, um, three three chords. And the, way, the reason I was able to do this is because I had a real guitarist, the name of uh, Adrian Bellu, playing real guitar, mm-hmm. while I was able to do the E, A, and D chords with heavy posing. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> all right. Well, fair enough. Um, so I while I was speaking with some of the composers, um, again they don't know I'm doing this. Again, again I plan on surprising them tomorrow. Um, but I did sort of try to get them to ask you questions without them realizing they were asking you the questions. So I ripped out some quotes uh, during our conversations. Um, this question comes from Gabe, um, uh, slash Misty is his screen name. And he asks, how do you go about breaking your own rules? Because um, you're always kind of innovating your own rules and kind of like you have a system, but then you sort of break that system every now and then. So how do you go about that? That's a really good question. Um, and in a way, asking the question answers it. To consciously go the wrong direction mm-hmm. will get you a result. If you're, you know, at first you end up in a bad place, ah, uh, but keep walking, and boom, suddenly you get to somewhere you wouldn't have been if you had stayed with the known path. Mm-hmm. So walk the path less traveled, basically. Well, you just got to take a left sometimes. <laughs> I like that. All right. This next question comes from, uh, again, Acolyte from Copeland. Um, and again, it was ripped out from his stream while I was asking him while he was streaming. He said, uh, what I would ask Stuart Copeland is more like a request. It's still a question nonetheless. I would ask him if he would pull out the sound fonts and show us all who's boss, end quote. <laughs> would that ever be something that you would be doing? Not at all. No, <laughs> I would join with them in a fraternal uh, spirit. Well, actually, that would probably be even better. I, I think they would all love that. <laughs> all, right. all right. So uh, before we send off here, uh, just two questions more. Um, I want to ask, because um, you have a humongous library of things you've done. Um, I'm just curious, is there a project that you've always wanted to do, but you haven't had the chance to do it still? 
I actually would like to do another game. I, it takes a lot of time and a lot of work, mm-hmm. and I'm not in that business. And I know, you know, the thing about film composing or professional commercial composing, because I did a lot of jingles as well, you know, Mountain Dew ads and so on, you know, <laughs> um, you know, music for hire. And I'm very proud of every everything because I learned things that I never would have learned if I had only been an artist following my own instincts. Mm-hmm. Um, I never would have learned all the stuff that I was forced to learn as a commercial hired gun. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, once again, I forgot where we started with that question there. Um, I guess it's a project uh, that you've always wanted to do. Oh, okay. The project, uh, playing, doing another game, I would love to do. And the generalization about commercial composing is that the work is great. The business sucks. Mm-hmm. And um, fortunately with Spyro, uh, we were very copacetic from the start. And once we got the groove going, they just lapped up everything. They never sent a single cue back. I never got a single note. But actually, um, the normal, uh, that's, a, that's a very unique situation. Uh, normally, they do kick it. You get notes. You have to put up with stuff. The business, it's very competitive. There's all mm-hmm. kinds of uh, players, the marketing people versus the game designers versus the, you know, all kinds of the power politics and so on. So the business sucks, but the work is fantastic. And I would, if it weren't for that, um, I'd, my, my favorite thing to do would probably be a game. You know, Red Dead Redemption. Uh huh. That would be absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> Hopefully, you get you, I don't. I don't play games. Mm-hmm. I enjoy it when I'm forced to, and if I was working at the same time, then I would enjoy playing the game, uh, mm-hmm. as I did enjoy playing Spyro. <laughs> My son is actually a game developer with Insomniac, who are the firm that hired me for Spyro. They Full sold circle. the intellectual property to Activision. But my son is over there working in the, you know, with the mm-hmm. same crew who um, created Spyro. Awesome. And he used to play as a kid. We, he's the eldest. And we would sit there with my seven children, uh, although Celeste was only like a, a baby. Um, and we would all sit there just like a family in the 50s watching TV, mm-hmm. watching I Love Lucy. All The whole family in the room there with, with Patrick on the control. Turn left, turn right, grab the treasure. No, you know. And all everyone, but Patrick is the eldest guy. Now Patrick works at Insomniac designing games. That's awesome. He's probably working on the what is it, Spider Man now? I think that's what they're working on for the PlayStation uh, Five. That came and went. I think uh, Spider Man was a big hit for them, and yes, he was working on that. Awesome. Yeah, I, I'm very excited for the next one that they're making. Um, so I guess to send off, I just want to ask: Do you have any piece of advice that you'd like to give to current and future composers that are looking to? Uh, again, replicate your style and make new music. Work very quickly. And and be very careful with the worst button on your computer keyboard, which is the undo. <laughs> um, don't judge yourself too soon. Sometimes, you know, come back to something and it'll have a whole new meaning. All it needed was mm-hmm. that one little note in the chord, and then suddenly that bass line pops into resolution. And so be very forgiving with yourself. Um, uh, lower your standards. Mm-hmm. Um, don't shoot for the cosmos every time. You, you, everything you compose does not have to be your finest hour, uh, your finest work. Be prepared to just screw around and make mistakes. You know, throw yourself off the cliff. Lower your standards. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And work very quickly. All right, well, Stuart, I absolutely appreciate you taking the time to do this. It really does mean a lot to me, and I'm sure it'll mean a lot to the community. Um, I'm a huge fan of yours, as everybody else is, and I can't wait to see what else you work with. Uh, excited for those operas, and hopefully you do get that video game project eventually. Uh, again, it really means a lot that you took the time to do this. Well, thank you very much for your interest. <laughs> Thanks for listening. All right. If you enjoyed that interview, please be sure to press the like button and leave a comment with your favorite moment from the interview. Also, if you're interested in any of the composers featured during the guessing game, all of their channels and songs we referenced are in the video description. If you want to keep up with Stuart and all his amazing projects, be sure to check out his website where you can see more details on his tours and his shows. That's at www.stuartcopeland.net. You can also follow him on social media. His Twitter and Instagram are on screen right now. That's at Copeland Music on Twitter and at Stuart underscore Copeland on Instagram. Also, be sure to subscribe to his YouTube channel. Uh, that's at youtube.com slash Stuart Copeland Net. 
and thanks again for listening.